Thank you all for joining us here at I-80 Sports, where today we're talking about some hockey players that are going to be making their return or may have already made their return already, as well as other news and notes around the NHL. Guys, thank you all for joining us here again at I-80 Sports. Thank you all for joining us here again at I-80 Sports. Make sure that you check us out down below at i80sports.com. And if you notice in the top right-hand corner, doing a little bit of not really rebranding, but a little bit of new looks upon the horizon, you can even check it out in our shop. And hey, if you like the beanie that I'm currently wearing here, especially in the cold weather that is the north right now, you can go check this out at our shop at i80sports.com. And if you're here on our website already and not familiar with our YouTube page, you can also find us on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash sports, where if you're not already, subscribe, like, and please comment on this video. We'd love to hear from you guys. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you follow us down below at I80 underscore sports NHL. And if you do follow us already, thank you guys so much because we greatly value all your support. Without you guys, we can't do this on a weekly basis. I'm Brian. He's Tom. Tom, how are you doing today? Uh, doing well, doing well. This weather has really messed with my sinuses, but other than that, I'm good. You know, it's one of them things where it's just annoying enough to feel it, but not annoying enough to be wrapped around in a blanket drinking Gatorade all day. I hear that. Actually, fun story. I had hockey on Monday, and for those that live in the northern New Jersey area, it uh, was pretty bitterly cold Monday going into Tuesday, and I left my hockey equipment outside, and lo and behold, I walked outside Tuesday morning, and the shirt that I wanted to go wash was frozen solid. I nearly <laughs> broke in half. So, yeah, I now finally understand what real cold actually means. To tell what? you the truth, yeah, to tell you the truth, moving around actually helps it out for me, so. Yeah, it's true. You know, just got to keep the blood flowing, just got to keep moving around, and that's really yeah. what helps. But – we're here to talk about hockey. We're not here to talk about beer league hockey. So it's time, as always, to hit up our traffic report. It's time to talk about the news. The I-80 Sports Traffic Report, where you can find all your news and notes from the week. We're going to be talking about some returns on the horizon in the NHL, as well as another person that is going to be returning as soon as tomorrow, and another person who has already returned and other returns that are coming nearby just amazing how it kind of worked out a light news week but at the same time it's just a week of returns first and foremost let's talk about the most controversial of course you guessed it yet again one of our favorite people we're talking about evander kane and evander kane has officially been released from the san jose sharks organization his contract has officially been terminated and he has a list of 15 teams currently interested in his services. One team that has been floated around and even has the owner making quotes on Evander Kane, the Edmonton Oilers, who have been needing some scoring help lately. So that being said, Tom, what does this mean for Evander Kane coming back into the NHL after his brief stint away? Where does he potentially end up in your mind? I mean, I guess Edmonton's the favorite right now, and, you know, it seems like all signs are pointing to him wanting to go there. Edmonton is a good team. They have two of the best players in the world, if not the two best players in the world right now. But you got – there's a couple factors here that that are getting me to scratch my head. Edmonton has dealt with controversy enough, and I'm not talking about off-ice controversy. I'm talking about on-ice controversy. You know, they can blow teams away. McDavid and Dreisaitl, one, two in scoring, top five in scoring. However you want to put it. When this team gets to the playoffs, they don't do anything. Edmonton, they've had trouble scoring goals, but the biggest two problems at Edmonton have been their defensemen and their goaltending. Evander Kane is not a defenseman, nor is he a goaltender. You know, if you were going to bring a forward in, wouldn't you maybe want you'd want to bring maybe a defensive type forward in, a player who could play in your bottom six? He's not that guy. He's not Barclay Goudreau. He's not Yanni Gord. He's not Patrice Bergeron. He doesn't play like that. If you're going to bring a forward in too to help this team, to help your team out to want to take the next step, wouldn't you maybe want to bring a forward in who's been in those wars, who's won the Stanley Cup or been to the finals and been deep in the playoffs a few times? Yeah, that 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 that's uh that's uh zeros across the board for me with him. 
So, okay, they want to give him a second chance. Edmonton's been known as the land of second chances. If you ever want to read up on Craig McTavish, I'm not going to go into the story now, but he had a little bit of pro a couple problems back in the 80s. Glenn Sather brought him back into the league, and he had himself a hell of a career. I get it. You want to give the guy a second chance. He screwed up. He screwed up again, illegally crossing the border into Canada. But from a team standpoint and from a needs standpoint, does he fill any areas of needs that you may have right now? And the answer to me is a resounding no. Yeah. I mean, for me, he could very well end up on the Edmonton Oilers. And I'm going to kind of just frame this in mind of like thinking he's potentially going to be an Edmonton Oiler. But any kind of signing with him, even going to, you know, a team in the USA is going to be halted at the moment or at least delayed by a little bit while they investigate him for violating COVID protocols by crossing the border to Canada illegally before New Year's. No matter what, he has expressed that he wishes to go to a cup contender. And Edmonton could very well be that. That being said, Tom highlights some very interesting points. He's a forward. He's not the main need of the Edmonton Oilers right now, which is defense and goaltending. Now, goaltending, you really can't address right now. There's really nobody out there to really trade for at the moment, unless you're going to blow back a team for an offer that they can't possibly refuse. But Edmonton doesn't really have the pieces right now to offer a deal like that. That and Ryan McLeod isn't that enticing to really give away. But that being said, defenseman you can go and get a defenseman right now you can go and trade for a defenseman if you really need it you know if they were really desperate and you know the devils retained some salary they could go get pk suban if they even really wanted to if it would help but that being said there are going to be teams out there that are going to be dealing defensemen which is why it kind of perplexes me that they would be interested in evander kane now there is one thing in the positive for evander kane it's the fact that he can score there's no doubt about it. He is a proven year after year after year after year goal scorer. When he is focused on hockey, he does it very, very well. Last season, he had 49 points in 56 games. That's not nothing. Over the past seven seasons, he has not had a season where he has not scored 20 or more goals. Again, that's not nothing. And it helps teams get to the playoffs. He'll contribute for any team that he signs for. But the question remains, is he really worth the baggage he brings? That I'm not sure about. And I think that's what also has teams on the fence, yet very curious about maybe signing him and interviewing him real quick and just saying, what's going on? Can we trust you? Will you kind of like leave your skeletons in the closet for like two minutes and actually focus on hockey? Because he would be very helpful to any team. Moving right along. Can I say one more thing about him? Sure you can. And I did on. lie a little bit about those playoff stats. He was on the San Jose Sharks when they lost to St. Louis in the conference finals in 2018-2019. Two goals, six assists, eight points in 20 games. I mean, that doesn't really scream playoff performer to me either. Yeah. And San Jose is also no, you know, how do I put this? How do I put this nicely? They haven't done very well in the playoffs all the time. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. They, they've got to the finals in 16. They got to the Western Conference finals in 19. But yep, and then got those stats back. for a guy like him, they don't scream playoff performer to me. No, and that's true. I kind of see Edmonton right now as like a early uh, 2010s Washington Capitals. Such a good lineup, such a potent offense. Can't quite put it together once they get to the playoffs. So maybe that trend continues for Edmonton. Maybe not. We're just going to have to see. Moving right along. Tuka Rask, goaltender Tuka Rask, has officially been released by the Providence Bruins. A moment of silence for his you know, imminent return. Psych, he's signing with the Boston Bruins and could start as early as tomorrow, which is Thursday, January 13th. And how will he do post-surgery? What does this mean for the Boston Bruins? What does this mean for potential playoff chances? One last playoff hurrah, potentially. Tom, let's start with you. What does this mean for the Boston Bruins? I mean, it means a lot. They're sort of doing the same thing that Anaheim did way back in 08. If anybody remembers, back when Anaheim won the Cup in 07, uh, Scott Niedermeyer, 
And I believe, yeah, Scott Niedermeyer. I think we may have lost Tom for a second there. Well, while we see if we can figure out what's going on with his internet at the moment, I'll chime in on this one and just say that this actually very well could be a very good signing for the Boston Bruins. This could be a very good move in general for the Boston Bruins. And more so, what does this mean for them? Well, it means that they don't need to rely on Jeremy Swayman as much, who has been backing up Linus Olmark. And it means that, you know, Jeremy Swayman, a young goaltender, can take his time and develop, which is huge for young goaltending. Just like defenseman, goaltending takes a while to develop. I'm going to switch the layout re real quick, just so that way you don't have to see both sides of my face right now. There we go. Um, it means that they don't need to rely on him uh, as much uh, going forward. It means that they can take the relief off of him and let him properly develop, get a lot of minutes down in the AHL in Providence, which would be great. Or you could still carry three goaltenders, and that's fine too. With COVID protocol and COVID on you know the surge in America at the moment, this actually might honestly be a really good move overall just to carry three goaltenders right now. Now, that being said, what is Boston getting from Tuka Rask? Even though Tuka Rask is going into his age 34 season right now and is starting a little bit late, he really didn't lose anything last year when he played 24 games. In 24 games last year, he had 15 wins, five losses, two overtime losses, and uh, sported a 9.13 save percentage with a 2.28 goals against average. Still pretty good for an aging goaltender. The year before that, career-like numbers. 41 starts. He had he was 26, 8, and 6, a save percentage of 9.29, and a goals against of 2.12. Now that being said, it's not like Tuka Rask is coming in and needs to fill an immediate need in goal for the Boston Bruins. Actually, right now. Goaltending really isn't that that bad right now for the Boston Bruins. As of right now, Linus Olmark, he in 16 starts is 11 and 5 with a 917 save percentage and a 2.57 goals against average. Jeremy Swayman in 16 starts as well, eight wins, six losses, two overtime losses with a 918 save percentage and a 2.26 goals against. They're both not having bad seasons at the moment at all. So that being said, Tuka Rask brings playoff experience, which is huge for the Boston Bruins right now, especially if they're going to make one last hurrah for that Stanley Cup and you know, just bring the band back together. This could be the last year they have Patrice Bergeron and maybe other pieces start you know, falling down the pipeline afterwards. We'll just have to see. But I like the signing for the Boston Bruins. I think it's them planning ahead for potential COVID protocols that could break out as well. That being said, now we're bringing back Tom to the mix. Hey, and guys. I don't know what happened. Sorry about that. I fixed it. Uh, but, yeah, like I was saying, I remember when Anaheim had did that to, um, you know, get themselves some fresh, older, fresh legs for the playoffs. It was Niedermeyer and Solani back in 08, the year after they won a cup in 07. I feel like the Bruins are doing the same thing. I agree with you, Brian, in terms of uh, they don't have to rely on Swayman nor Allmark anymore. They can let both develop. And I think what the Bruins are doing, too, they're a very veteran-savvy team. And they're a team that maybe isn't going to try to go on a run within their own division, but maybe try to grab that first wild card spot so they can play in the Metro bracket. You know, they had their way with the Capitals last year. They had their way with the Canes two years ago. And for argument's sake, say if the Rangers get that spot, I'm a Ranger fan, but the Rangers are new to this, are going to be new to this whole playoff thing. These guys, did. this Bruins core has been together now over 10 years. You know, they know what it takes to win in the playoffs. Maybe they didn't win as many cups as they should have won, but they know what it takes to win in the playoffs. They know what it takes to go deep in the playoffs. Bringing Rask back is great, you know, because you start them off slow, and by the time you get to the springtime, they'll be fresher than a lot of other starting goalies in the league, despite them being younger, despite some being younger, despite some, you know, maybe playing the same amount of time. But I do think that, yeah, it's a last it's a last hurrah for the Bruins. I think they're going to bring them along slow. I think the Bruins' whole plan is, like I said, to try to get the wild card slot to play in the Metro bracket. That's what I think the Bruins are doing. But, yeah, I think this means that they are going on one final playoff run. We don't know where Bergeron will be next year. You know, and like I said, the core's gotten older. Bergeron and Marshawn, both in their 30s now. 
you still have Poster knock and hold, but this thing that I keep predicting with the Bruins where they may blow it up or may try to rebuild the depth again, you know, it's still very much on the table. They didn't have the greatest start, but right now, like you see, they're playing more of their games on hand now, and they're slowly, slowly and slowly creeping back up the standings like I had predicted. So I think Tuca will be fine post-surgery. Will he win a Vezina Trophy? Probably not. Will the Bruins be a playoff team? Probably less. Where they will finish, I don't know. But not sound like a broken record. I think in their minds they want to be the wild card team in the weaker bracket. Yeah, and I just think overall, like I had mentioned before, this is just a decent move overall by the Boston Bruins. I think this is just going to ultimately help their playoff chances going forward. Moving right along to more news before we get into our quick hits. We have more returns that we have to talk about because, of course, returns on the horizon. This person already returned, actually. Evgeny Malkin, Gino, is back with the Pittsburgh Penguins following successful knee surgery. And in his first game back, posted two goals and an assist in his return. Good for you, dude. And uh, he has not played since June because of that knee surgery. So the question remains there, Tom. Does Evgeny Malkin continue to have an impact for the Pittsburgh Penguins? What do you think? I think so. I think so. The Penguins have been really hot lately, but the Penguins have also been hot and cold all season. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Like the Bruins, this could be the last hurrah for the Penguins, really. It really could be. I think that Crosby and Malkin are basically going to, you know, try to run the ship and try to show. Remember, these Penguins are not the Penguins of yesteryear. Mario Lemieux is no longer in charge. You have a very progressive GM, not GM, I'm sorry, a very progressive president now there in Brian Burke, who has never been afraid to start ripping teams down. I know it sounds like a broken record. You can go to any episode we've recorded. I've probably said this 17 times. I'm sorry, but it just needs to put, be put out there. But I think Crosby and Malkin are trying to prove a point to them and say, hey, listen, we still got it in us. We still got the legs in us. Which is true. Crosby's playing well, and you look how Malkin played in there. He played very well. The Jimmy Rutherford style of Pittsburgh Penguin hockey is like he did back then. Crosby, Malkin, and Kessel, he had them on different lines. I think they're playing Crosby, Malkin, and Carter on all different lines now. And you're basically inserting the youth in there with them. And that's how they won those two cups in a row. And I think that's something they're still doing, especially with Mike Sullivan as coach. So we have to see. Obviously, we've seen it before where Crosby, remember Crosby had come back 10 years ago. And I remember me as a Ranger fan, the Rangers won their division that year. But I remember I was like, oh, crap, the Penguins are going to pass us. And then what happened to the Penguins? They went out in round one. Last year, the Penguins got really, really hot at the end of the year. Won the Eastern Division because that's what it was last year. That's the alignment we had. Went out in round one. So I think it'll help the Penguins during the regular season. But like I said, the Penguins playoff, Penguins playoff performances over the last two years have not been anything to write home about. So we really got to see what happens here. I think it puts them in the playoffs. Where it puts them, I don't know. I think that it may very well come down to them. I don't think they're going to be fighting for a spot, but I think it's going to be them and those aforementioned Boston Bruins basically swapping those wild card spots, you know, to see who's going to play where. Because I can tell you right now, you have those three juggernauts in the Atlantic Division in Tampa, Tampa who are the two-time defending champions, Toronto and Florida, who I hope play each other so somebody can win a playoff series. And, you know, who's ever goes in there against Tampa, you're going in against the defending champions. It's not something you're going to want to do if Tampa does, in fact, finish in first. So we'll see what happens. But I think it will be a big help, but I just don't know what will happen come playoff time. Yeah. Personally, I think that this is a bigger turn for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Obviously, if you've been living under a rock, you know how good Evgeny Malkin is. Evgeny Malkin is one of the few players in the league currently that actively is a over a point per game player statistically over the course of his career. He's one of only a few players that currently are. And, you know, he's a former heart winner, former, you know, multi-time all-star uh, Ross trophy winner a couple times. I mean, he's the last time last season was the first time that he has not scored more than a point per game. So, and that streak extended all the way back from 2011. That was, you know, starting from there. From 2011 all the way up until 2020, he was a point-per-game player. Last year, he fell short by just maybe five points. This year, he's already starting off strong, three points in one game. 
maybe continues that production going forward. But obviously, the Penguins are getting back one of the best centers in the entire league. And they've got a two-headed monster on their hands with Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. And as I've said before, if you've got if you've got Evgeny Malkin and Sidney Crosby on your roster, you are always going to be battling for a playoff spot. And this was an already hot Pittsburgh Penguins team that is about to potentially get a little bit hotter with Evgeny Malkin adding in his production. So this is huge for the Pittsburgh Penguins. It also gives a little bit of relief uh, to other goal scorers who have been doing well as of late. More on that later because there is one Pittsburgh Penguins player that I am going to mention as one of my high performers of the week. Um, but yeah, this Pittsburgh Penguins lineup has already been on a tear. And getting back of Evgeny Malkin is huge, obviously. And welcome back. <laughs> welcome back, Gino. It's good to see you scoring again. Moving right along now to finally some quick hits around the league. So speaking of returns, like we have been this whole entire episode, Jack Eichel has returned to practice post-spinal surgery, and he's that much closer to his Golden Knights debut, which is really, really cool to see. Uh, he was hit with a wave of emotions uh, touching the ice for the first time yesterday. It's really good to see that a guy is that passionate about what he does. Uh, speaking about more imminent returns, uh, Miles Wood of the New Jersey Devils skated for the first time since his knee surgery, but his return is still allegedly months away. So we still will wait a couple more months for his return. It was speculated at the end of the season that he could very well miss the entire season. It's now looking like he might play some games towards the end of the season. One thing to keep in mind with Miles Wood at the end of the season, he is a UFA for the first time. It will be interesting to see if the Devils try to re-sign him by the end of the season. Uh, moving right along also, uh, the KHL has suspended their season for a week to mitigate uh, a COVID outbreak that they currently have uh, amidst their entire league. Uh, speaking of postponements, the New Jersey Devils postponed their game from this past Monday due to a COVID outbreak on their team. And Mackenzie Blackwood, their starting goaltender, has also just entered COVID protocol along with their backup goaltender, Akira Schmid. So tomorrow against the New York Islanders, they will have John Gillies and a player to be named later behind him in net. And uh, the Devils, you know, just a little side note, they lost to Columbus by one goal on Sunday with basically only two NHL lines. So Good on the Devils so far. Since the break, they have been a very good team. Um, Minnesota has re-signed John Merrill to a three-year contract extension that will start next year, but it is a quite team-friendly of a $1.2 million per year deal for John Merrill. John Merrill's been doing great so far for the Minnesota Wild, and it does seem like he loves it in Minnesota, and Minnesota certainly likes him. They brought him in this past season on an $800,000 contract, and it's good to see him get extended and finally you know, be seen as a good defensive defenseman. Uh, so now he is currently signed through 2025. Uh, last thing, the waiver wire, as usual, Minnesota placed Rem Pitlick on waivers, and today he was claimed off waivers by the Montreal Canadiens. Maybe, maybe Montreal thinks that this is the spark they needed. No, maybe not. So, uh, Tom, did you have one more thing that you want to add? Yeah, our favorite team in the Southwest, the Arizona Coyotes, are having problems again. That new arena proposal that everybody thought was going to be a short thing apparently is going to fall through. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with them over the next few weeks. Uh, once we find out more information, maybe we can get a little more in-depth into it in the next coming weeks. Right now, this th that's all we know. That's all anybody knows right now. Yeah, and we'll certainly be diving into that you know, probably in the coming weeks, because this is going to be a saga that is just going to evolve and evolve and evolve. Now, time to start wrapping things up. It's time to start talking some high performance. It's time to talk about the players of the week. Your I-80 Sports High Performance Players of the Week. So time to talk some players of the week here. Tom, who do you want to highlight this week? Well, I want to highlight your favorite player from last year, the one who uh, you loved so, so much. Oh, no. And he made his return this year at a decent time, so nobody can get mad at him this year for making his return. And that's oh, no. number 86, Nikita Kucherov. Oh, my God. 
Ah, yes, I knew you were probably going to mention him. He Had was. himself a nice little return there in his last five. Well, not even in his last five, because his last five, two of those games were in October. So he came back, has played three games so far, three goals, two assists in five games, two assists in his first game back against the Flames, potted a hat trick against Buffalo the other night. Now I got another guy here who's of some curiosity to me, I guess you could say, and that is Tomas Hurdle. It's going to be interesting with him. In his last five, he has six points in his last five, four goals, two assists, and it's really going to be interesting to see what happens with him. Because right now, the San Jose Sharks find themselves in a playoff spot after a lot of people, including us, who consider themselves a rebuilder. The problem is the Sharks don't find themselves in an obvious playoff spot. They don't find themselves comfortably in first or second in the Pacific Division. They're in the wild card spot with Calgary and Edmonton below them who could very well catch fire and pass them. So it's going to be real interesting to see what San Jose wants to do with him. Do they want to trade him for value or do they want to keep him? But he's playing very well right now when he's got them in a playoff spot. So I'm Really interesting to see what happens with him over the course of the next few months. Good mentions there. I've got a couple out-of-the-box players to mention, but those of you that have been following uh, these teams know that these guys are worth mentioning. So I'd said before that with the Pittsburgh Penguins, there was one player I wanted to kind of shout out here. Well, here we are. Brian Rust. Brian Rust has had quite the week this week. Three games played. 11 points in those games, seven goals, four assists, and was a plus six as well. Wow, wow, wow. He lit the lamp so many times this week. Good on you, Brian Russ. Another player I want to mention from St. Louis, Jordan Cairo, 11 points in five games, five goals, six assists, also a plus six as well. And he did that in two minutes less ice time than Brian Russ did as well. Again, looking really, really good lately for the St. Louis Blues. Um, I'm going to keep harping on this one just because it's just going to annoy Tom, and I'm just going to keep digging that dagger a little bit deeper. Jack Hughes. What more can we say about Jack Hughes I mean, lately? Don't get me wrong. I could have said Mika Zibanejad this week too because he's been having himself he's been having himself some really good games. I could have said Capo Caco too. Capo Caco – despite not potting goals, has been getting on the board. He's been making things happen on the first line with me because of Vanna Jad. So I could have said those two, but I didn't. This is fair. Now, in Jack Hughes's case, he's been one of the top players of uh, the entire week. Uh, in six games played, he has 12 points, four goals, eight assists, uh, plus six as well for the Devils. And he's just finding them back in the net. Things are just clicking right now for Jack Hughes and – I'm going to be really interested to see how this you know progresses for the remainder of his season going forward. But it's time to wrap things up now with our question of the day. And our question of the day is simple. It's time to speculate. Tom, where does Evander Kane ultimately end up? Well, unfortunately, I do think Edmonton. I do think Edmonton, and I think that's a terrible fit for both sides. We discussed – We oh, I just want to elaborate one more thing. We discussed oh, what Edmonton's needs were earlier. I'm not going to repeat myself. We discussed how dysfunctional Evander Kane is. We discussed the dysfunctionality within the Edmonton Oilers. I mean, man, this is like this is like dropping a TV into a bathtub, if you ask me. To tell you the truth, if you were to ask me where I think he should go, just go look at the Central Division and look at your second and third place teams in the Colorado Avalanche and the St. Louis Blues. A little more forward help there. A team that has won the Stanley Cup and another team that has had some playoff success and is very, very serious about winning the Stanley Cup. If you read stuff that Nathan McKinnon says, I think if he went to Colorado or St. Louis, he would straighten himself out real fast. I think him going to Edmonton is the worst place he could go. So I ultimately think, where does Evander Kane end up? I mean, the answer is probably jail, but like, I guess we're picking an NHL team here. Yeah, it's probably Edmonton, to be honest. I think Edmonton is probably, if if it looks like a duck walks like a duck and quacks in this case, and we're just hearing these speculations, it very well end up could being, it could end up being Edmonton. Would I be shocked if it's a different team? No, I honestly wouldn't because he's a proven goal scorer. And if there's anything that NHL teams have proven, they'll look past certain deficiencies and just sign a guy if they think they'll be good. 
see Tony D'Angelo this past summer. Um, so anything is possible. I think Edmonton is a very likely location just because it seems like they are dead set on it. But like I said, would I be surprised if he signs elsewhere? No, I would not. But that being said, guys, what do you guys think? Do you agree? Do you disagree with us? Do you think Evander Kane is going to end up with Edmonton? Do you think he's going to end up somewhere else? You got to let us know down the comment section below. While you're there, drop a like and also subscribe if you're not subscribed already. But you can also find us down below at iedsports.com where not only can you find our NHL coverage, you can also find our NFL, NBA, MLS, NCAA football, and wrestling coverage there as well. We'll be streaming every Wednesday night for AEW going forward. So you want to make sure that you check that out as well. And hit up the shop if you like my beanie, you want to stay warm in the wintertime, you know you definitely want to. Hit up our shop, get yourself this, as well as other goodies for this season. And make sure that you follow us on Twitter if you're on Twitter, at I80 underscore sports NHL. And if you're following us already, thank you guys so much because we greatly value all your support. Without you guys, we can't do this on a weekly basis. But it's time to get back to watching some hockey. Happy hockey night, and we'll see you on the other side. I'm Brian. He's Tom. This has been yet another episode of NHL on I-80 Sports.